Well, good morning and welcome. This is the NAS at North Lakes Adult Sunday School class for November 15, 2020. Now, today's session is number 11 on the Ten Commandments, and we're going to be looking at the Ninth Commandment, You Shall Not Give False Witness Against Your Neighbor. Now, the title for today is As Good As Our Word, and the long subtitle is the words that come out of our mouth are a direct reflection of the integrity of our hearts. And the goal for today is to develop a greater awareness and watchfulness over the truthfulness of our speech and our intentions. Now our scriptures for today are Exodus 20, 16, Zechariah 8, 16 and 17, and Matthew 5, 33 to 37. Okay, now a little insight. A strict interpretation of the Ninth Commandment in Exodus 20 seems to forbid perjury in legal procedures, proceedings. <clears throat> While in Deuteronomy 5.20, the Ninth Commandment despite the same English translation, uses a different Hebrew word that is a broader term that refers to evasive testimony. Now, in the legal situation implied in this commandment, testimony refers to evidence that verifies or disputes the truth of an accusation so that justice can be carried out. Now the word false can mean fraud or deception. The purpose of false testimony is to intentionally deceive others. Uh, and in particular, to deceive the ones who are making the judgment. Given false, F <laughs> Given false evidence can lead to injustice and harm to others. God wants honesty. Swearing falsely is a form of rejecting the truth of God. I guess if we were trying to find a loophole, you might try to say this is only talking about testimonies in trials. So telling little lies is okay every day, every day little lies, you know. They're okay, as long as it doesn't hurt anybody. However, that is a real stretch of, and uh, you know, the other Old Testament texts, as well as the teachings of Jesus and the apostles, would not support that kind of a loophole. The Ninth Commandment essentially prohibits telling a lie. So, a little additional insight here. The first sin involved the dishonest speech of the evil one, which elicited dishonest speech from Adam and Eve. Because of fear, Adam and Eve hid from God and used dishonest speech to uh, deflect blame. Now humankind continues to engage in dishonest speech out of fear a perceived need to deflect or defend, or to cast disparaging light on another for our own guilt. Okay, connecting to my experience here. A video of a government official was edited in such a way to suggest this person was having a medical emergency. The video was quickly debunked but not before it had been shared thousands of times. The edited video became a contemporary form of false testimony. When have you seen such forms of false testimony at work? And what were the consequences? To begin, I want to tell you a story that occurred about 50 years ago. My first boss that I worked for in the state of Wyoming, in the Wyoming Highway Department of Transportation, 
was uh, promoted to become the district engineer for the department in Casper, Wyoming. And one summer, during the construction season, the local television station asked for an interview about the traffic problems being caused by construction. He agreed, and he went to the studio, and they interviewed him for over a half hour. And then that night on the news, they showed a five-minute interview. My friend told me that he would never believe anything he saw on the news again because he now knew that they could edit and make a video of you saying things you never did say. It is now 50 years later. And I feel like I have been watching political ads from both major parties that have been selectively edited. I know they have been selectively edited because I have watched and heard live events and later seen tapes of them that didn't say the same thing. There are thousands of people on social media, probably millions of people on social media, but there are at least thousands who have the equipment to edit videos and to publish them where they are reposted unlimited times. The truth, the truth was never the goal in these videos. Instead, a selfish and self-serving agenda was. The consequences are that when we see the edited videos, we may believe it is the truth, especially if we had not seen the event live and what, and what we had um, see here in the, in the edited video agrees with our own agenda. Our lives have been filled with false testimony and we need to pray that we will know the truth because, you know, the truth is what sets you free and it's also what pleases God. Why do we continue? Well, back up here. Why do we sometimes participate in or at least tolerate false testimony? What benefit is to be gained? I believe that maybe sometimes we get caught up because what we hear supports our agenda. So we want to believe that it is true. This is why we need to seek God's agenda, not our own. Remember, God is the same yesterday today and tomorrow. So his agenda will not be opposite of what is revealed in his word through the and uh, what the Holy Spirit guides us to in prayer. Any benefit gained through false witness is only temporary and it comes at a price. If those given false testimony do not repent and ask forgiveness, that price is eternal and way too high. So how are your truth detector skills when it comes to media, co-workers, family members, and so on? How do we know when others are telling the truth? I believe that we all probably believe that our truth detector skills are much better than they really are. When I was in college, I took a couple of semesters of psychology along with my engineering courses because I knew that I had to deal with people as well as construction materials and plans. Now, I have had a, have had to deal with a lot of people telling lies on construction projects. And I always relied on waiting to learn the facts in a situation to determine what the truth was. Some people have tells that show us, that show up during a lie, if they're telling a lie. You know, like a little, little girl who plays with her hair while well, she's uh, telling you a story here, maybe, that isn't true. Or a boy who refuses to look you in the eye. 
or the superintendent or engineer on a project that begins a conversation with, you know you can always trust me. I have always did not trust people who told me that for some reason. Uh, I have prayed for God to give me discernment that would help me to know the truth. You know, and when the Holy Spirit confirms the truth, that is the best. So, connect into the Word. Okay, our first scripture is Exodus 20, verse 16. Uh, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You know, much of life relies on honesty. Without honesty, relationships deteriorate. And uh, much harm can happen to innocent people. Our society, for a society to function as it should, people must be honest and forthright, not deceptive and withholding. Okay? What are the consequences for a society when individuals fail to take responsibility for the truthfulness of their speech? Well, people don't know at that point who they can trust. They may hear something that isn't true and it can cause them to no longer trust a friend. You know, if we become skeptical of everyone, then we may also dismiss the truth when we hear it. In what ways have you seen consequences of untruthfulness played out in our society? In our society, we can see bitter reactions to others that do not believe the truth as we understand it. It can end in discrimination and even violence. It always drives a uh, wedge between individuals and groups when one or both sides reject any kind of civil, honest discussion of ideas and dismiss honest debate. When do you see dishonesty? Oh, back up. Where do you see dishonesty most prevalent in our world? I would have to say in the political arena. Now I have seen it rampant in third world countries where I've lived and now I have seen it running wild in our home country. The commandment here specifically forbids false testimony against our neighbor. Now that was being a neighbor is a designation that is often interpreted as applying only to fellow Israelites. So can we get away with just as long as we tell truth to uh, other Christians? Are you ever honest with those you know while remaining silent or even being dishonest with those you don't know or care for? Why? Now, I do not remember any time during my adult life when I was intentionally dishonest. I may have stated something which was not true, but I had believed it was based upon, it was true, based upon a source that I trusted. I have, on the other hand, not told people some truths because I believe that it would uh, result in reactions that would not be productive and that minds would not be changed. I have also not told everybody everything I know. Um, there are things that I know uh, and or believe a truth that may cause pain to be pain or to be harmful to one that I know as well as to ones that I don't know. How does this inconsistency go along against the heart of this commandment? 
We have to be truthful in all situations. So when we are not, it would be inconsistent with the heart of this command. Why is honesty to be practiced in all areas of our life with all the people in our life? As a follower of God, we have to live a certain life with character. We have to live our life with character and integrity so that everyone will be able to trust us and our word will be our bond will be as good as our word. It needs to be a lifestyle and not a persona. Now a little insight on our next scripture. Zechariah prophesied it after the destruction of Jerusalem and the Babylonian exile in 587 BC. Some of the people had returned to the, the destroyed cities and started rebuilding the city and temple. As we studied last quarter in Ezra and Nehemiah. But they had become discouraged, right? And we can read about that in Ezra chapters 3 and 4. Zechariah tells of God's plan in his prophecy to bring his people back to restore Jerusalem. He also warns this new generation to avoid wrong choices of their end. The, back up again, man, I'm going to have a good reverse button this morning. Uh, this new generation to avoid the wrong choices of their ancestors. He expresses hope for God's glory in his prophecy uh, to fulfill, to fill this new temple and for the coming of the Messiah. So we're going to read Zechariah chapter 8, verses 16 and 17. These are the things you are to do. Speak the truth to each other and render true and sound judgment in your courts. Do not plot evil against each other and do not swear falsely. I hate all this, declares the Lord. So the first question is, what specifically did Zechariah tell the people to do? Well, he told them to speak the truth to each other, which is an important thing here. See, that goes kind of along with the uh, Ninth Commandment, right? He told them to render true and sound judgment in the courts. He told them... Do not plot evil against each other. And then he told them, Do not love to swear falsely. I guess that's do not love telling lies. Huh? Of all the commandments God could have reminded them, the Israelites of, at this return from exile, special emphasis is given to the commandment to live lives of truthfulness and justice. Why might this commandment be so central in reestablishing the people's corporate life together? I believe to have a society that can thrive and endure, it needs to be based on truthfulness. This is necessary so that people can trust each other and rely on each other to do as they say. Now the four actions listed in these verses are all tied to the ninth commandment. Next question. To be the people of God is to be conformed to the heart of God. In light of this passage, what might it look like for us to align ourselves with the heart of God? In order to align with the heart of God, according to this passage, we need to tell the truth to each other, right? We need to not plot evil. We need to uh, never give false testimony. And we are to always judge based on the truth and sound judgment. These are things that God loves. 
to not do them means we are doing what God hates. God's good intention for us most often comes about in and among us through obedience. Now, do you get that? God's good intentions for us, what God's plan is for us, God's good intentions. You know, he said he's going to take care of us. I have a plan for you, right? It often comes about in and among us through our obedience. How might the call to truthfulness and integrity create space for the restorative work God wants to do among the people of God? God was calling people back from being exiled in foreign lands where they had been part of different cultures. There were probably many people who did not know each other very well here, and they may have been very skeptical of each other when they came back together. The call to truthfulness and integrity, if followed, could create a high level of trust and community. This was a path of restoration as a united people under God. You know, that was needed if they were going to accomplish the restoration of the temple and of the city of Jerusalem. They needed to trust in each other. Why do we sometimes fear the commands of the Lord and speak in the truth faithfully in particular? I think the simple answer is because the commandments can condemn us. We know from reading Romans chapter 7 and 8 that the law is what defines and makes us aware of what sin is and of our own sinfulness. If we are trying to please God by keeping the commandments, we become a slave to the law. And it will continue to point out our failures. Speaking truthfully is probably the most difficult one to keep as we have lots of justifications as to why we just cannot tell someone the whole truth. The law is powerless to save, according to Romans, because it was weakened by the flesh. We need to remember that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because through Christ Jesus the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. We are called to live according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh. God forgave us he will continue to watch out for us. He loves us. We just need to be obedient. And if there's something between us and God, we need to repent and let get it taken care of so that there is no condemnation. Okay, here's a little more insight for the next scripture. The following verses are part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Jesus continues the pattern here, started in verse 21. He quotes a, com a command the people are familiar with, and he follows up with his deeper interpretation of the idea behind the command. Jesus moves beyond the Old Testament commands, and he sets a higher standard for his followers, and that includes you and I. So, we're going to read Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 through 37. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, Do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, 
do not swear an oath at all. Either by heaven, or by God's throne, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond that comes from the evil one. Now the people of God should be marked by truthfulness of speech and consistency of life that there is no room for doubt or any room for the need for oaths. People swear an oath to try to uh, strengthen their uh, promise or whatnot, you know. In a culture that seems to need a disclaimer or a caveat for every word spoken, in what way can the church embody an alternative? Now, it does seem in this time of political correctness and supersensitivity, people are extremely careful with what they say. And in contracts and agreements, people always want to add a disclaimer or a caveat. Otherwise, they want to build in a loophole. In other words, there. I believe the church needs to be true to the truth of God's word. It seems to me that some have shied away from preaching that the problem is sin. And the only solution came through the blood of Jesus shed on the cross. You know, they might say, who are you to say someone is a sinner and they are bound for hell if they do not get washed in the blood and repent? Well, you know, we are the body of Christ and we need to speak the truth even when it isn't always what somebody wants to hear. Is the church so well known for truthfulness, integrity, and justice that it is assumed to be as good as its word? Why or why not? Unfortunately, currently I do not believe it is. There has been stories about the failure of some well-known Christians. A lot of people in the world have the idea that, have an idea of what a Christian should live like. And when they see church attenders who do not live up to that ideal, they want to say all Christians are hypocrites and they want to have nothing to do with the church. So, you know, unfortunately the church is not as well uh, thought of as it should be as far as being truthfulness, integrity, and all that. So, how can the church practice costly truth-telling while actively rejecting half-truths, self-serving, spinning of information, and the uninformed spread of questionable facts. I could say we just have to do it, right? But that'd be a little oversimplification. We are God's representatives on earth. And we need to remember, as Christians, we have the power of the Holy Spirit who teaches, who will teach and guide us. We also need to remember the people Christ came to, they hated him and they crucified him. And Jesus also told us in his word, in his word that uh, not to be surprised if the people around you hate you and treat you badly. 
If we do not speak the truth, we are letting not only God down, we are also letting the people we speak have truth to down as well. You know, they need the truth that is Jesus if they're going to be saved. Jesus unabashedly associates excessive oaths and swearing by anything as coming from the evil one. How might our conformity with the world's ways of communicating with oaths and guarantees unintentionally pardon us with the work of the enemy? As I look at this question, I have to say I'm not sure. The only thing that I can think of is that we may be putting a stumbling block before someone who is watching our actions. Those actions that compromise a teaching of Jesus. And if we do what Jesus told us to do, um, let me back up here. And if we do what Jesus told us not to do, then we would not be keeping his commands. And if we're not keeping his commands, we would not be loving him or others. So we need to uh, not conform with the world's way of uh, communication here, using oaths and uh, even when you write a caveat in there. Okay. Connecting to life in the world. The commands concerned in truthful speech are as relevant today as they were when they were given. God still desires that God's people reflect the divine character that divine character of truth and justice. So how does dishonesty work in ways, work its way into our speech in subtle ways through omission, spinning information, or half-truths? Well, I believe that everybody has an agenda. Now, hopefully, for you and I, that agenda is uh, God's agenda, right? But even with a good agenda, we also have preferences as to how events will play out. We want certain things to happen certain ways. Uh, we want uh, people to act certain ways. So sometimes in conversations, uh, we may promote our preferences by editing, by turning our preferences into an editing device just to spin a detail or to admit, omit a word or two or maybe even an entire opposing fact. How can those habits practiced over time impact our relationship with God? How might these habits impact others? One of the problems with this type of communication is that we tend to justify it because we did not actually tell a lie. But at the same time, the person we are communicating with probably is doing the same thing. And this type of communication tends to drive us apart instead of bringing us together. One of the results, if we are in a habit of this type of communication, is that we may be tempted to talk to God the same way. Forgetting that God already knows our thoughts even before we have them. You know, choosing silence, here's a question, choosing silence instead of speaking up 
in certain situations may feel like an inconsequential decision. In what kind of situations might someone be hurt by our silence? Now, I'm sure none of this never applies to any of us, but uh, you know, when somebody is given some false witness about someone during what we, we might refer to as a gossip session, and we know it is false, but we feel reluctant to speak the truth, you know, it may appear to a third party that uh, you are confirming the false witness that may ruin an innocent person's reputation or have other re unexpected results. I didn't write this down, but I want to tell you a little story about um, I, my grandma. I had a grandmother that uh, lived next door, and I used to go talk to her sometimes. And, and uh, she would tell you stuff that's going on, and she would talk, and she would give her opinions of things. And, and I found out by the time I was a teenager in, uh, in high school that when Grandma told you something and said something about a situation uh, and you didn't agree with her, you'd better say something. Because for Grandma, the uh, next person she talked to would say, you know what Rusty said? And she would quote what she had said that you didn't agree with, but you didn't disagree with her, so you said it. And this is the way it comes across sometimes if we don't speak up. When was the silence of those who perceived themselves to be righteous when has the silence of those who perceive themselves to be righteous had a damaging, even fatal impact on others? What can we learn from such examples? I think one specific trial here that uh, I can uh, think of would be the trial of Jesus when he was condemned by false witness from the religious leaders in Jerusalem. But no one who knew the truth spoke up in his defense. And when the answer to the last question, if the person being silent is seen by others as being truthful and righteous person, then that false witness that silence made is strengthened even more, right? One common source of subtle dishonesty is in how we present ourselves to others. In person, through social media, or by other means. How can we practice honest speech? Question, how can we practice honest speech in how we present ourselves to others? You know, when people make out a resume, they want to make the best impression, and they want to make the best impression in this resume about their integrity and their experience and their interpersonal skills. You know, I've always put together my resumes with an accurate list of example projects. Sometimes, however, the sales department would edit my resume to add projects that I had not included. And I had not included them because I had had only a very minor role in the project. When I objected to this, I was told that it was okay because I had been on that project. And besides that, it looked good on the resume and the reader would not know what my role was. You know, we need to be truthful as to our description of who, of what, and of where we were. 
We need to let our yes be yes and our no be no. How can this counter-cultural practice create opportunities not only for witness but also for authentic community? You know, if our relationship with someone is based on the truth and God's love, from the very beginning, then they will come to trust us and make us at, and take us at our word when we tell them what tell them that we care about them and that God loves them. That uh, you know, when we have a relationship that we can say that, you know, that may uh, lead us to their re, uh, relationship with God, for they can have a relationship with God as well. This may well uh, lead to developing more relationships, and that all will be combined into making a community, a Christian community. We need to be known for that we tell the truth and that uh, we care. Now, like Jesus' listeners, we might be tempted to strengthen our voice by appealing to promises, oaths, and other sources of humanity, and other sources of authority. So, you know, are we uh, tempted to swear an oath, you know? I swear on my mother's grave that this is true. So here's some homework for you. Two questions here for you to think about. What would it look like to be a person known for being a, as good as a word? To you, what would that look like? The second one is, how might this transform our witness in the world? If we were a person as good as a word and people expected that of us, would that, would that transform our witness in the world? Let us have a closing word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning and we think about this and we know sometimes uh, we probably have um, omitted saying th things that we maybe should have said in, in the truth. Not that we're trying to hide the truth, but we just have our own agendas and our own things. And we just pray, Lord, that you would just help us to uh, always have the opportunity to speak the truth. Because we want to speak that truth in, uh, in love this week and throughout the rest of our lives. We just pray, Lord, that you would uh, help us to uh, always look to you and to uh, have your agenda in our life the agenda to see other people come to the saving knowledge of, um, of you. And that's, I believe, is probably your whole agenda, is to bring people into a relationship with you. And we just pray, Lord, that you would uh, be with each one who uh, listens to this uh, Sunday school class. Just touch their hearts and... Uh, just bless them in a special way this week. And uh, every time we open our mouths to speak, if there is uh, anything that's going to come out that's not right or we're going to leave something out, Lord, just uh, nudge our hearts and uh, help us to uh, establish that we are somebody as good as our word in uh, all instances. And we just pray, Lord, that you would uh, be with us throughout the week. 
keep us and bless each one. In Jesus' precious name we ask it. Amen. Okay, that's about all I have for this week. And uh, I pray, Lord, that uh, pray that you guys will have a great time and a good afternoon. And just remember, God loves you, and so do I. Bye.